So before we begin, uh, once again, thank you, Basil, for uh, supporting our chapter. And then I will uh, read your bio first, yeah, before we begin. So uh, Basil Anthony Burry is a graduate of the Royal Military Academy, uh, Sandhurst, United Kingdom. He served in the Jamaica Defense Force, GDF, for 11 years and was awarded the Medal of Honor, General Service for his work with U.S. Army Intelligence during the Caribbean uh, Peace keeping operations in Granada in 1983-84. Following his retirement from the GDF in 1988, he joined Atlas Protection, Coco Rios, limited as its regional member, uh, manager and served as managing director from 1991 to 2014. In 1999, Captain Bury received a diploma in forensic psychophysiology from the world-renowned Baxter School of Lie Detection in San Diego, California, and successfully completed the John E. Reed and Associates course in advanced interviewing and interrogation, interrogation techniques in 2001. He established forensic polygraph services in 2002 and had, has to date administered over 9,000 polygraph tests. And then this will be our discussion today. Uh, Captain Bury has been a member of ACS International since 2005 and is the holder of the Certified Protection Professional, CPP, Professional Certified Investigator, PCI, and Physical Security Professional, PSP, designations. Mm -hmm. He is at present the treasurer and program chairperson of the Jamaica chapter, having previously held the position of chapter chairman for a total of 12 years, 2005 to 2008, and 2012 to 2019. He is also a member of that in, uh, investigation council, an associate member of the American Polygraph Association, a founding member of the Jamaica Polygraph Association, the chairman of the ex-JDF uh, Officers Re Reunion Committee, the member of the board of management of the Walmart Trust School, and the chairman of the Walmart Preparatory School. He is married and has four children and three grandchildren. Oh, you are a busy old man. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's begin. Yeah, uh, time is yours. Yeah, please uh, do presentation, Basil. Um, you have a uh, uh, twenty-five minutes. Is it okay for you? Or that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Chico. All right. Um, as as Chico indicated, um, my presentation will be on um, polygraph in the security industry. All right, um, well, don't think I need to spend any time on this slide, but as Chico indicated, I have 11 years experience with the JDF, 26 with uh, a private security company. I am the owner of a, um, a company um, called Forensic Polygraph Services, of which I have 23 years as a certified poly polygrapher, uh, 17 years with ASIS, of which 12 was spent as the chapter chair. Um, I'm the winner of the 2016 um, Regional Award, the um, Professional Certification Board's Regional Award of Appreciation, um, 2018 ASIS Meritorious Service Award, and the one that's very dear to me is the um, E.J. Chris Coley Jr. CPP Volunteer Leadership of the Year Award for 2020. All right. Um, at the end of my presentation, um, participants will be able to understand and appreciate the impact of employee theft. All right, the methods of personal security screen and an important and the importance of background checks for employees, and of course the benefits of polygraph examinations in the security industry. All right, now. The trusted employee. All right. How often have we heard that there's a case of white collar crime at a business place um, only to be told that it was my best employee who was the culprit? Well, employee thieves normally don't fit the stereotypical career criminal profile. They often are in good standing, have worked with a company on average of four to five years, 
and nine out of 10 of them are first time offenders. And that's, those aren't my words. Those are the words of opportunity knock. In many small businesses, the major reason fraudsters can commit their crime is because management trusts them too much. Their family members or longtime friends, or they have a proven work record and years of service. Again, that I'm quoting from the trust factory. The impact of employee theft is not a question of if, but how often and how much. All businesses have experienced employee theft in one form or another. Over 75% of employees have admitted to pilfering from their workplace. Many rationalize that periodically dipping into the pot will not hurt the business as the theft amounts are negligible. These small thefts, however, when combined, equal to 5% of the annual business revenue. And that is coming straight from the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Employee theft impact. One, 33% of all business bankruptcies are caused by employee theft. The theft of non-cash property jumped from 10.6% of company fraud cases in 2002 to 21% in 2018. So it almost doubled. Bribery and kickbacks account for 15% of all fraud cases and the most difficult to detect. Fraudulent schemes last on average 18 months before being detected and 40% are discovered through tips and 15% by internal audits. And almost 60% of victim organizations fail to recover any of their losses with only 14% making full recovery. All right, the demographic of employee theft. Losses caused by men are 75% larger than losses caused by women. Employee theft was committed by men 59% of the time and by women 41% of the time. Fraudsters who had more than five years service stole twice as much than employees with less than five years tenure. The average age of a perpetrator is 48 years old. And 85% of fraudsters displayed at least one or six, or have a, at least one out of six behavioral red flags. And of course, when they're speaking about red flags, they're talking about um, persons not wanting to take vacation, persons obviously living above their means, persons wanting to work at times unsupervised. All right, all right. Those are a number of the red flags that often go unheeded. All right, now there are a number of security preventative measures. Obviously the background investigation, it's, it is advisable that you do a, a background check before you employ persons. And you'd be surprised how many companies don't do a proper background check and they pay dearly for not doing so. Um, there's the behavioral investigative interviews, something I would have learned on the John Reed course that I attended, something I recommend highly. And of course you have the polygraph, psychometric testing for honesty, oh, random internal audits, regular awareness training, of course, whistle blowing policies. All right. This, Today I'll be touching on background checks, behavioral investigative interviews, um, psychometric testing for honesty, but most of my time will be spent on the polygraph. So I will quickly touch on background investigations. All right, most important investigative process 
and ought to be done ideally prior to the job offer, especially for high risk positions. The best predictor of an individual's future actions is to know what they have done in the past. Increasing tendency of the courts to extend the corporate responsibility, and I might add liability for the safety and security of staff, guests and customers whole thing of vicarious liability. Best outsourced to spare company personnel of potential embarrassment, as well as liability claims. It costs less with volume. Screening can be done by trained staff free of bias and corrupt motivation. One third of job applicants lie on their application form. It might be their work history, criminal record, academic qualification, driving record, credit history. Application form should incorporate a statement indicating that any falsification, including omission, can be considered grounds for a non-hire decision or termination and require the applicant to say that all the information given is complete and accurate. Red flags on application forms are unverifiable employment and gaps, family business, questions left unanswered, erasures, and of course, changed answers. All right, and I recommend the blanket information authorization form to allow former employers, supervisors, landlords, et cetera, to provide information sought by the employer and should include a waiver of liability for providing information in good faith. Now, the behavioral analysis interview. All right, um, the, the science or that supports its use is known as kinesics is a systematic study of the relationship between the long non-linguistic body motions and communication, better known as body language. And it's something that we all practice, but it's something that I recommend all right, for further study. And it's an interviewing technique designed to elicit verbal, and nonverbal responses in order to assess a subject's basic honesty and integrity. Uh, it's conducted in a non-threatening and, con and conversational manner and differs from an interrogation or a routine job interview. And I mentioned earlier, the re-technique is considered to be 80% accurate in detecting deception when done by a trained practitioner. All right, and of course, I and thirdly, the psychometric test for honesty. All right, it's an assessment tool that can provide an accurate insight into a job applicant's work ethics, reliability, integrity, propensity for substance abuse, and attitude towards employee theft. And it's something I use, uh, well, I used to use extensively when I was running the security company. The test can be administered online, but can contain culturally unconscious bias, which may put people from different cultural backgrounds at a disadvantage. And the cost varies and needs to be weighed against the benefits they can bring, which usually will be less in lower skilled roles. If you have to pay for this service, then of course you have to be very selective as to who you um, apply these tests to. Now, my, my pet um, project, the polygraph. Now, the polygraph has been around for over 100 years. All right. Um, Dr. William Marston, an American attorney and psychologist, is credited with inventing an early form of the lie detector 
1915. Picture of it is, is displayed. Um, John Larson added the item of respiration rate to that of blood pressure. He's credited as naming the instrument, the polygraph, which is a word derived from the Greek language meaning many writings. And in 1938, Leonard Keeler added a third physiological component known as the psychogalvanometer, which measures changes in a subject's galvanic skin resistance, otherwise known as perspiration. He also painted the prototype of the modern polygraph and is known as the father of the polygraph. Between 1945 and 47, John E. Reed, who is again, he's the gentleman who introduced the Reed technique. A lawyer from Chicago developed a polygraph technique that included the use of character evaluating questions. In 1958, all right, my mentor, Cleve Baxter, an ex-polygraph examiner with the CIA, introduced the quantification system of chart, chart analysis, thus making it more objective and reliable. And in 1992, the polygraph made its official entrance into the computer age with the introduction of the Stalting Computerized Polygraph based on an algorithm written by John Hopkins University. Now, how does the polygraph work? Well, the underlying assumption is that everybody has a conscience and, and can readily distinguish between right and wrong. All right, it's the fear of discovery that causes the body's flight fight response to release certain hormones like adrenaline and cortisol into the bloodstream, speeding the heart rate, slowing digestion, shunting blood flow from the stomach to the muscle groups in your arms and legs and giving the burst of energy and strength. And that sequence of events is known as the flight fight response. And there is a biblical reference, which I often quote when I'm conducting my tests. And the one, and Proverbs 28, verse 1 says, The wicked man flees, though no one pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Now, interestingly, the people who do badly on the polygraph test, their body's behaving as if they're running, they're perspiring. Their blood pressure is elevated, their heartbeat is on rapid, and they have difficulty breathing. All right. It's akin to somebody running, even though at the time that the test is being conducted, the person is very much stationary, in fact, seated. And those who tend to do well on the test are the ones who have nothing to fear. All right, they are emboldened by the process and you can't get bolder than a lion. All right, and there's another quote of scripture, which is whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. And I have found that when I make mention of these two biblical passages, you'd be surprised how many people have admitted to their wrongs. All right, it's almost as if I have established the bona fides of the polygraph. Now, here's a picture of a polygraph chart. Those two squiggly lines at the top is actually recording the subject's resp respiratory rate. So it's that breathing rate. The middle line, that line, was a green colored line. That's actually the... Um, that is the line that records um, the subject's perspiration, the electrodermal activity. You normally have two little metal plates on, on the subject's um, finger or fingers. And when they sweat, you'll see where it peaks. And the, the red line at the bottom, or what they call the tracing, is recording blood pressure and heartbeat. And what the examiner is looking for is identifying the questions 
which are triggering that flight fight response. Now you'll notice there are two um, numbers at the foot of the chart. One is numbered 48, you may not see it so well, in the, and the, other, the one to the right is 33. Those represent the questions and the time it took the examiner to ask the question. And if you notice to the, the question to the right, you saw a greater reaction. There was a, a change in the amplitude of the blood pressure. So you saw it getting narrower and there it peaked. Well, that would be indicative of a lie. Similarly, and especially because what you're looking for is not just one reaction. You want to see at least um, all, all of the um, markers reacting at the same time to the same question. And in order for added, um, let's say, accuracy, it is advisable to run the test at least three times. So you're looking for consistency as well with the reaction. And you often change the, 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 um, the position of the question on the test to see if the subject reacts to that particular question, regardless of where it is positioned on the, on the polygraph um, test. All right, now there are three phases to a polygraph examination. The pre-test interview, which is the most important phase, it lasts anywhere from 60 to 80 minutes. All right, and during that phase, the examiner is reviewing the case information, establishing rapport with the subject, and is conducting that behavioral assessment. All right, um, that same technique, which was, um, let's say, um, introduced by Mr. Reed, John Reed, known as the Reed Technique, all right? And you're also, that time is spent formulating the test questions with the subject, explaining the test procedure, all right? And of course, you require the subject to sign a consent form, all right? That is by far the most important phase. If that's not done properly, all right? Um, you're not gonna get the best out of the instrumentation. All right, um, then we have the clinical phase where you actually attach the, the, um, the devices to the, to the individual, um, the blood pressure, you put the blood pressure cuff on the arm, you put two pneumotubes across the chest. And of course, I spoke about the, 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 the two metal plates on the fingers, all right, in order to record the subject's psychophysiological responses. Now, a test consists of about 10 questions. And the questions are asked at 20 to 25 second intervals. So an actual test chart takes between four minutes, roughly four minutes to be completed. And it's advisable to run the test at least three times. I um, have gotten into the habit of running the test at least four times. I want that added chart to assist me in arriving at a, at a decision. Because I tell people, um, no matter how many polygraph tests you, 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 you administer, you're as good as the last one. And the third phase is the post-test, where you analyze the charts and you prepare the report. And if your client so requires, you might wish to share, they may wish for you to share the results with the subject. All right. Now, if that happens, that's normally because the client is keen on getting, wants to get a, a confession. All right, you may get admissions, oftentimes self-incriminating admissions during the pretest phase. But if you, but it's not until you complete the, the the clinical phase and review the charts, all right, and you confront the subject, are you likely to get a full, a full confession? Now, all right, uh, there are legal aspects that one has to observe. Um, they differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, all right? The polygraph test results are inadmissible in criminal cases in many jurisdictions. And that's the case in Jamaica. I don't know what obtains in, in, in Indonesia, but, and, and I suspect that might be the case where you are, um, gentlemen, because the court's position is that the decision as to whether a person is lying is for the judge and the jury, and that the polygraph would be seen as usurping this function. 
and confessions given during the course of a polygraph are admissible. In fact, I have had to go to court. Um, well, let's say a tribunal and give evidence um, where, the, where an individual admitted to the offense um, whilst I was administering the pre, the pretest interview. Now, my Jamaican experience, which is what I suspect you've come to hear. Okay, I said, as indicated earlier, I've, I've tested over 9,000 persons since 1999. 75% of the subjects were males. 60% of the males and 45% of the males failed the polygraph test. 85% of all cases involved employee theft. All right. Uh, it's rarely that I get a call for anything other than theft. Um, I, of that, um, I've interestingly, since COVID, I've seen an uptick in the number of domestic or relationship type tests. Yes, um, I get the odd call where a spouse is requiring their um, other party to submit themselves to a polygraph test. In those cases, the men, the men fare better than the females. In fact, I would hazard to say that when I've been asked to conduct a relationship type test, to determine whether a party is being unfaithful to the other, the female members or the, of the species, species tend to do worse than the males. In fact, it could be as high as 70, 80%, all right? Um, and I, I've come to the realization that the reason why the women do worse than the men is because by and large, the men don't show up for the test, but the women will turn up with a, with the hope of beating the polygraph. So that what probably accounts for um, men doing better than females when it comes to relationship type testing. All right, um, less than 10% of the tests that I've done uh, involve pre-employment screening. All right, um, which is unfortunate. Um, if they, I believe if companies were using the polygraph for pre-employment screening, they wouldn't have to be spending so much money on, um, on in the investigative aspect, the employee theft, because they would probably screen out a lot of undesirables. 65% of the subjects who fail either confess or gave self-incriminating testimony. All right, so I'm almost assured that if you sit in front of me, I'm gonna, you're gonna tell me something which you probably ought not to have, especially if you're guilty of the crime. And 99% of all the robbery cases that I have done, I have, I have found that there had to be, there has been internal participation. In fact, no self-respecting robber is gonna carry out a robbery unless they have help on the inside. And it might be, um, inf uh, could be simply information as to where, as to the movement of the cash. All right, but they won't undertake a robbery case unless they have somebody on the inside giving them some useful information. And what is surprising, less than, it's actually less than 4% of the persons interviewed that I get to interview refuse to be tested. And it's largely because I think the average Jamaican believes they can beat the polygraph. And it's the effort that you make to try to beat it, which, which causes you to do so poorly on it. Now, see, these are some of my regular end users. Well, large conglomerates, no surprises there. Um, Agribusinesses, all right, are big users of the polygraph. Tourist attraction, inbound merchants, um, the business processing operators, insurance companies, supermarkets, manufacturers, gaming, arcades, government agencies, hotels, jewelry stores, security guard companies, 
courier services, pharmacies, gas stations, airline and shipping lines, fast food operators, and of course, spouses. All right, it's, and, and this list, list is, not, um, is, is not exhaustive. Uh, there are many more entities that have now seen the benefits of polygraphing, um, whether it be their staff prior to employment or if they have a problem, especially if it's an internal issue, then um, invariably a, a, a polygraphers, polygraphers services are often required. The advantages of the polygraph. Well, it's an ex excellent investigative tool. Um, it's useful, most useful in screening out undesirable applicants. It's, the, it's faster than any other conventional method, all right? A polygrapher is often able to render a, a, a decision or a, as to whether the person has passed or failed a test within, 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 I would say within an hour of completing a polygraph, all right? It's a strong deterrent factor. And of course, I mentioned earlier that the confessions are in fact admissible. Disadvantages? Well, the polygraph is only as good as the examiner, all right? So it's not a situation where you buy the equipment and you just plug and play. You have to know how to use the instrument. You know how, as I said earlier, if you don't conduct a proper, a, a, a good pretest interview, then you're not gonna get a, a good result. Um, it's not infallible. It is considered up to 95% accurate. Um, garbage in, garbage out. So if you get wrong information or inaccurate information, then you're gonna render an inaccurate um, finding. And it requires subjects written consent. Um, and, and as I indicated earlier, the test results are inadmissible in certain jurisdictions. All right, um, now uh, at this point, are there any questions? Ada pertanyaan dari teman-teman. Is there a question from uh, uh, participants? Uh, may I have a question? Um, yeah. Secondary. May I have yes. A yes. Yeah, please. Uh, I see the the data of your experience very uh, surprising. You have a good experience, but uh, just want to know when you have uh, experience meet with the subject who has uh, as well experience as yours. Yes. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, he has uh, experience in uh, technique and everything. Yes. And then uh, uh, your subject, uh, the quality of the subject as qualified as yours. And then you use your technique, how uh, you handle it based on your experience. Thank you. All right, excellent, excellent question, Franz. Uh, fortunately, I don't come across very many people who have as much experience as I do in the, in the polygraph, um, but I have run into a few and it, it's a little more challenging. However, I tell people that um, as long as you practice what is considered the recommended um, technique, even those who have experience will be found wanting. I should point out that I, I have been polygraphed at least 10 times, all right? It was part of the training and I thought I could beat the polygraph test. And I tried various techniques and on each occasion I was tested, it found me lying, it caught me lying, all right? And I know what it is that the polygraph is seeking to achieve. And I wasn't able to beat it. Now, of course, you can go on the internet and read up on the polygraph. They, they, they speak of various countermeasures. And again, those things will only, they don't necessarily help you. They actually hurt your case because it's the effort, as I said earlier, it's the effort that you take to try and beat it, which actually cause those reactions that those psychophysiological responses. I believe if you went in there um, and you probably showed no, let's say a nonchalant attitude, you'll probably get, do better than somebody who was trying to, um, let's say, um, engage in countermeasures. Uh, one of the things a polygrapher will do is to find out whether or not you have take before you actually do the test during the pretest, 
is to find out whether or not you're, you're taking any drugs. Now, what drugs will do, they won't necessarily help you to pass the test. What drugs might do, it might reduce the size of the reaction. So it makes it a little harder to read the charts. All right. But um, the reality is even people like myself who have been trained, whether it be in the John Reed technique, wherever we are polygraphers, um, it's the, 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 the polygraph will still work and works well. I, I, I have said, well, I'm on record to say that the hardest people to polygraph is actually persons who suffer from panic attacks. Because you do have people who, I mean, it's almost like they're a bag of nerves. Those, and again, all it requires you to do is to spend more time with them during the pretest phase. All right, calm them down. You know, relax them. All right, if you're in, if you're in a hurry to do a polygraph test, then you're not gonna. I mean, I say, I say, um, on average, I spend anywhere between, I, on average, ninety minutes. But I will, I have spent um, two and a half hours, three hours. And sometimes mm. the, the, the tests that take the longest are the ones involving relationships because there are a lot of emotions involved. Mm. And you want to establish that rapport. You want them at a point where they are at a, they're relatively um, relaxed, comfortable before you test them. Now, obviously, if the person is guilty, no amount of um, relaxation, no amount of comfort, no amount of reassurance is necessarily going to help that person. All that is really, all of the pretest is really assist the person who may be innocent of the offense. They're so um, nervous, so wind up, all right, that they feel that they, there's no way they're going to pass that test. You have to reassure that person. All right. That's the person that I spend the time with. All right. Because the worst, I mean, I would say my, uh, the, the, the worst case scenario is to call a guilt, uh, innocent person guilty. I mean, yeah. it has happened. I won't, I won't, and I, in fact, those are the cases I will always revisit and see where I made my mistakes because invariably I did something wrong. All right. And one of the things that a polygrapher has to be mindful of is ensuring that you don't allow your biases, your whether conscious or subconscious biases, to somehow influence your decision making. Easier said than done. I remember one of the first cases I did. I, I got a job where some money went missing from this business place. Um, and I had two people to polygraph it. And it had to be one or, two, I, one or the other that stole the money. And when I went, when I saw the first person, I mean, the guy was, uh, he had a gold tooth. He had a lot of them very um, creative hairstyles. Um, he was from a particular neighborhood in Kingston, which wasn't one of the nicer places to live. And I said to myself, well, this is tantamount of shooting fish in a barrel. Because I was kind of in my mind saying, well, this is going to be easy. And I ran the test with an expectation that, they were going to, that this person was going to fail and confess. Well, he kept on. I noticed that he was doing better than expected. I ran the test a second time. He did even better. I ran it a third time. And I said, wait a minute, this guy is clearly didn't steal the money. And then when I met the second person who looked on the, on the surface to be a Christian, upright young woman, I mean, dressed well, spoke well, well, she failed the polygraph test and she actually ended up admitting to more money than what was stolen. So I learned very early that you make certain that you don't bring your, your prejudices and your biases and your um, preconceived notions, all right, to the when you're doing the test, because if you do, you're going to get burnt. Okay, thanks, Captain. All right, I if, mentioned uh, earlier. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, if possible, no. I I want to another query uh, about this. It's okay. Yes. Yes. Of okay. course. Uh, this is about uh, white collar crime. Yes, which is uh, in in your uh, story. The, the previously, you, you most of your uh, investigation deal with the theft or like uh, uh, robbery, something like that. But uh, if the subject uh, like uh, 
high profile yeah. because uh, as far as i know the uh, uh, white color crime conducted by the people who has a position is smart experience yeah and then yeah. Uh, they can hide the case which is difficult to find out with the question to answer yes or no uh, uh, yes appreciate if you uh, share your experience about this thank you all right I, I, I'm, I'm, I hope I understood your question Franz but um, you mentioned people in positions of influence often commit the white they well white collar crime that's a fact and um, they, how do how do I get them to um, well one to answer the questions on the test is that what you you're seeking to ask all right, yes, well, first uh, of all, yeah. all right first of all um, in order I don't one of the first things I tell my clients when they call me inform the people the people who you have as persons of interest let them know that you're considering this as an option don't spring it on them you know don't don't ambush people let them know up, up front that listen something happened at the office we have reason to believe it's an inside job we're going to be asking everybody who had an opportunity to have committed this act to um to cooperate with the investigation all right and i and i also tell my clients that um always invite persons to write a statement encourage people to write something all right reason being the people who are less likely to give you any information are those who have something to hide those who are directly involved in the in the crime they're not going to cooperate if they give you a statement it's very it's going to be um very um inadequate it's going to be short on detail the more information people are willing to give you as an is a good indicator that they want to cooperate with you and they may be truthful all right so that's the first thing i recommend and once you collect the statement from the person they normally call me in i look at the statement and then I start asking questions and trying to get more detail. And oftentimes I will get a lot more information that, than what was reduced in writing. All right. And it's how you sell the, the polygraph, because I often tell people, listen, we have reason to believe this is an inside job. The reason why we're doing these tests is to clear you of any suspicion. So it's always to clear people of suspicion. All right. Yeah. And, and you find that people cooperate, even the people who are in senior positions because I mean I've done jobs where the senior manager all right often volunteers and say well in order to ensure everybody else um, falls in line I want to be the first person in fact I, I remember doing a job where I thought that was the case only for me to realize that the senior manager was the culprit he was actually the person who was who was doing the stealing or the fraud and remember the questions that I'm gonna be asking on the test would have been questions which would have been formulated during the pre-test interview. So what you're looking for is you wanna be asking um, no more than about three or four what they refer to as relevant questions. Like um, the relevant questions would be, well, do you know who stole the money? Um, um, did you benefit from the theft? Um, was it you that removed the money from the safe? all right so it's very specific very direct questions all right which requires either a yes or no response all right so those questions are free of any ambiguity all right my, your understanding and my understanding of that question must be the same all right i remember some time ago i did a job for an inbound merchant he lost a piece of jewelry very expensive piece of jewelry he told me that the piece of jewelry was stolen from the showcase all right. And I started asking questions about that. I said, was it you that removed the jewelry piece from the showcase? Do you know for certain who did? Did you benefit? I was getting some, what they refer to as the field, inconclusive results where I wasn't able to determine with any level of precision whether or not that individual had passed or failed the test. I went back to the client and I said, there's something wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting very clean charts. I said, are you certain that this piece of jewelry was taken from the showcase? And when he checked, it was actually removed from the safe. It wasn't from the showcase. So what happened? The person who was able, who, who stole the, the jewelry piece, was able to answer that question truthfully, even though they did it. 
Because when I was asking him, did you take that jewelry piece from the showcase? They said, no. They knew, in, they knew within them, they knew that there was a flaw in the question. All right, now had I asked, did you take that piece of jewelry from the shop or from the safe? I would have gotten a, I would have been assured of a better reaction and what is referred to in the field as a more deceptive response. So again, the information that you work with has to be accurate. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, hey, no mention, Captain, no Captain Barry. Uh, yes. It, it's very interesting uh, experience and uh, some tips is uh, very useful. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any, I have a few. I'm gonna, um, Chico. I have a few cases which I'm going to share with the, yeah, please, with the members. Please. All right. So they have an idea of what, 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 some of you know, some of my successes. All right, well, first of all, I probably should have told you that um, a polygraph test takes about, I mentioned it earlier, anywhere on average 90 minutes, but it can take two hours. Um, people can beat a polygraph test. It's not, it's not um, infallible. Um, will nervousness affect the results? The answer is, if that was the case, then everybody would fail because everybody that is required to do a polygraph test is going to show some nervousness and how you how you deal with nervousness you will ensure that there are questions on the polygraph test which you already know the answer to so invariably the first two questions i ask in the test will be is your name chico and are you 30 years of age now that's information that would have, you would have given me during the pretest i would have probably had it before i would have ensure that I saw a, a, a valid ID card to ensure that the person in front of me is in fact Chico. So you're asking at least two what they call neutral questions. That will tell me how the person, how the subject reacts when they're speaking the truth, even in their nervous state. All right, so these are some of the checks and balances built into the test. What causes inconclusive results? Well, I mentioned one of them. Um, imprecise information, and sometimes failing to properly prepare the subject for the test. In other words, the last thing you want to do is to test somebody who is being accused of being a thief. You know, in other words, the police have already um, interviewed him or interrogated the individual and, uh, and, uh, and basically uh, is threatening to lock up the person. That person is no, in no condition to run a poly for you to administer a polygraph test, all right? And there are persons who I will not test, all right? I'm not testing pregnant women. Mm. Once you tell me you're pregnant, I'm not testing you. Out of an abundance of caution for the unborn child. Um, children under the age of 18, unless I get the parents' written consent. Um, persons who suffer from mental disorders are certified, obviously. Because a person, if you're not fit to plead, then you're obviously not fit to submit to a polygraph test. And I'm not going to submit um, polygraph somebody who has a, um, what do you call a, a heart condition where they have a pacemaker. Uh, if you have a pacemaker, then you're off limits, not testing you. And of course, I'm not testing you if you're not willing to sign a consent form because I'm going to be putting devices on your person. I could be charged for assaulting you. I could be charged for wrongful detention. In fact, people have threatened to sue me for, for impersonating a police officer, all right? I've never been sued, threatened, yes, but when I produce my consent form, everybody backs off because they know that I have been, I've got, I've done what is required by law. Mm. How much does a test cost? Um, it varies, but on average, the a polygraph test will cost around between two and 300 US dollars a pop. Obviously the more tests you do, you get volume discounts, but on average it's about between two and 300, all right? The pre-employment is normally cheaper than the investigative type. All right, here are a few cases that I did, which I want to share with the, with the, with the members. Uh, this was an investigation uh, that was initiated, interestingly, at the request of a hotel worker who was appealing his decision, uh, his dismissal. He had actually gotten fired. 
All right, he went through the HR. It was the matter was the subject of a hearing. He was dismissed because everything pointed to him. He volunteered. He actually contacted me and volunteered to do a polygraph test. All right. And although the computer records indicated that his personal identification number was used to defraud the hotel, however, the polygraph test showed no deception indicated. In other words, he passed the test. Subsequent tests identified the perpetrator and the wrongfully dismissed employee was reinstated. So, and I mentioned this one because oftentimes people think that the polygraph is anti-worker. Oh, well, so it's not, I, I, the polygraph is actually, I see myself as working in order to ensure that justice is done. All right, too often the good suffer for the bad. All right, something happens, you don't know who did, who, who did it, everybody gets dubbed with the, gets blamed, all right, gets penalized. And I think that's unfair. And it's an effort. I see the, the polygraph is an effort to, to do spear fishing rather than net fishing. All right, now here's an interesting case. Um, an investigation was initiated regarding the theft of cash from a bank lodgement at a travel agency. Four of the five staff members who had access to the lodgement agreed to undergo the polygraph. Remember, there's only four, one refused. The polygraph test showed no deception indicators. So the four that did the test all passed. The trusted financial controller who had refused to be tested subsequently admitted to the theft and following an internal audit made restitution for this and other fraudulent transactions. And this ran into millions of dollars. And the third one, an investigation was initiated regarding the theft of um, 10,000 US dollars from a gas station. All 20 staff members on duty denied stealing the money and agreed to undergo the test. The polygraph test results showed that all of the staff were stealing <laughs> from the station, but only one, only the janitor was found deceptive to stealing the US dollars, all right? Sometimes what you find happening in this case, because the lady was spending so much money, she said, I don't, I, all right, yes, I lost 10,000 US dollars. But in addition to me want, wanting to, find, in, 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 rather, in addition to her wanting to find out who stole that money, she said, well, if I'm going to be spending all this money with you, Captain, you may as well tell me what else they're stealing from me. Well, everybody was stealing something. And it was dependent on what they had access to. All right, but it was only one person, the janitor, all right, who failed that, that particular question on the test. And we were able to recover 50% of the money. Mm. All right, um, some takeaways. I tell people that good systems keep honest workers honest. All right, workers do what you inspect not what you expect, all right? The best fraud prevention efforts will concentrate on increasing an, an employee's perception of being caught. If people believe that there's no, there is no consequence to carrying out a crime, then they're incentivized to do it, all right? An ounce of prevention will save more than a pound of cure, all right? Mm. So I'm all for, all right, being proactive. I'm, I, I tell my clients, do they put something in place to ensure you don't hire the, right, the wrong people? It might be a polygraph test. It might be a, a more comprehensive background check. It might be the psychometric test that I, 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 I mean, I, I mentioned earlier, but do put something in place, provide, Give yourself a leg up as to ensuring that you're hiring the right person. And having hired the person, put the necessary checks and balances in place. All right, because if you don't, you're going to be, you're going to pay daily down the road. And of course, when all else fails, polygraph. Now, interestingly, I, I, I told you earlier that I ran a guard company on the North Coast. At, at one stage, I had about 600 officers working for me and I was working for some of the, the blue chip 
hotels on the, um, in Jamaica. I really, I did not polygraph my security guards on joining the company. And the, re and the reason for that is that if I did, I probably wouldn't be able to fill the vacancies. All right, what I did do, I, I ensured that the ones who worked on my blue chip contracts, I remember those were, were randomly tested. Those who worked at, my, at the entrances to the hotel, all right, the entrances and the exits, they had to sign a document agreeing to be polygraphed at least once or twice a year at my discretion, all right? It kept them on their toes. All right, so it was very, I was very selective. One is because of the cost and the time. And two, I, I, I realized that if I, I'm not, you're not gonna find um, anybody who has, I mean, in other words, people are not necessarily going to tell you their dark secrets, all right? And if then, so you really don't want to be polygraphing people willy nilly. Use it judiciously, and you get you find that more people will cooperate with you. Um, and as I said, I and to this day, we even though I left that company about seven years ago, they still have many of those hotel contracts because the persons that they have working there are persons who have who I who I say are combat tested, and they're proven to be a, a cut above the average guard. And of course, we were also in the armored courier service services, so we moved a lot of cash. Those persons were also regularly tested. But the run of the mill security officer, um, they weren't. And it was largely because where you're pulling your security guards from, they will have um, issues. So the emphasis there was ensuring that the people that you had proper checks and balances, you put in the necessary management controls in place, and they knew that if something went missing, then I was going to, of course, they would be the subject of a, of a polygraph. And, and that kept many persons um, on the straight and narrow. And I believe if you, uh, if once you have the proper checks and balances, most people will conform. I think that ends my presentation. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Barry, Basil. I, uh, so the thing is, uh, uh, is it possible that uh, two X minute, I mean, uh, two polygraphers uh, have a different result? Yes, yes. Possible? Yes, it's possible. Um, it's happened. Um, I've, I've had to test persons that have been, who have been polygraphed by another individual. Mm -hmm. And we got, we got um, differing, um, differing opinions. Again, the polygraph is, as I said, it's as good as the examiner. Mm -hmm. It's good as is, as the examiner, so it's it's a tool. Okay. All right. All right. It says yes. There's some science that supports it, but there's an art involved. I think oh, I'd right. like I would like to think that I am above average, largely because of the my years of experience. I mean, I was doing investigations long before I did polygraph. All right. Ah, okay. I, in fact, intra how I got involved in investigations is because um, when I joined the JDF. Um, if you, whenever you did anything which was considered a breach of procedure, uh, they invariably gave you extra work. And the work often came by in the form of an investigation, all right? A traffic accident investigation, mm -hmm. an audit investigation. In other words, you got punished. The way they punish you is giving you some investigations to conduct. So I got, I got my, more than my fair share of punishment. So over time, I became very good at investigating traffic accidents and board of inquiries and audit boards. All right, so that is how I became, and you could almost say I became an investigator by default. Now, what happened is that after I left the army and I started working for this guard company, um, I was somebody who served in the US Armed Forces, was highly recommended to me for employment. And I employed him on the basis that they had done a thorough background check. It was one of them placement companies, personal placement. And he, let me tell you, this guy was highly educated. I mean, he looked, I mean, when I met with, met him, interviewed him to offer him the job, 
I was impressed. Big mistake. Mm. All right, within a year, he carried down the company millions of Jamaican dollars. All right, he was a fraudster. When, when, all right, and I paid dearly for that mistake. And that is what encouraged me. That and some other incidents. Can you, can you imagine, Chico, how embarrassing it is? When yes. you run a guard company, you send this, your, your, your client asks you to provide a guard to uh. perform the services of a, of a store detective. So he's there to catch the shoplifters. And then yes. the client calls you a couple hours later to tell you to come and collect the guard because they've caught the store detector or detective shoplifting. Uh. <laughs> yeah, right. so it's embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. embarrassing. So it's because of those experiences. I said I needed, there must be something out there that could provide me some relief. And that's how I ended up um, enrolling in a polygraph school all the way in California. In fact, I didn't know there was one in Florida. If I knew, if I knew there was one closer to Jamaica, I wouldn't have gone so far, but I'm happy I did because the guy I met was, consider, was considered the guru. Okay. I mean, this guy had devoted his life to polygraphy. Okay. All right. So I got trained by probably one of the best. All right. Um, okay. And I have slavishly followed his technique. Mm -hmm. All right. And it has worked for me. Um, and uh, and um, in fact, it, I what was supposed to initially be a management tool became a so a revenue stream for the company. So mm -hmm. I eventually sold sold my equity in the guard company and focused on the. On, on, on investigative services because I was earning far more money for far less stress because I, I don't know what the case is in, in Indonesia, but when you have labor, when you're, when you're employing 600 people, any one of which, all right, can cause your business to be, um, is at risk. I mean, they, I mean, they only have to do something stupid mm -hmm. and they don't even have to be a theft. Right, right. All right. So, yeah. That, that, okay. that could, so this is, that's, that's, that's really my story. Um, and when I started out, I was there, I, I was, you could almost say I'm the one who popularized the use of the polygraph in Jamaica. Because the only other person at the time who was so trained was about 70 and had retired and he just did the odd job. Now we have more polygraph examiners in Jamaica than the United States per wow. capita. In the States, they will probably have, I think they're probably around, they probably have about 3,000. We have at least 60 in Jamaica for a population of less than 3 million. So wow. we have a higher concentration of polygraphers than in the United States. And when I started out in 1999, there was only one other person and he, and he was in his 70s. Okay. So it means that the, uh, uh, the polygraph uh, in this case is uh, just a tool you mentioned there. It's a right? tool, yeah, it's a tool. Yeah. But, but the, the person behind the, the, That's right. the one that translated, the one that make uh, 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 translate the, uh, the data is, is, the, the, is the key then, right? That's right, that is the key. Okay. That okay. is the key. Okay then. So uh, any question from other uh, from uh, uh, participants? Any? Uh, yes. Uh, but, yeah. Andres, yeah. please do so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Basil, uh, I have a question. Uh, so uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, polygraph is actually illegal in some jurisdiction. I'm not sure uh, in Indonesia if it's a lot or not. But if, we, if it is illegal uh, to be conducted in Indonesia, especially in the private sector, what is the next best uh, alternative to uh, polygraph? All right, well, all right. Now, um, when I mentioned illegal, it's, it's actually inadmissible in for court purposes, remember. In other words, if you were to polygraph somebody and, and they failed a polygraph test and you decided to fire them on that basis, you could find yourself on the wrong end of a lawsuit because the, at the, the courts are, are gonna say, well, that's not sufficient evidence. Mm -hmm. That's not sufficient ground. Not even in Jamaica is it sufficient ground. I tell my clients, do not dismiss, do not take any adverse decision based wholly and solely on a polygraph test result. All right. 
I'm, I'm working on a case right now where um, a very high valued, high net valued um, tourist lost um, a piece of property. And I had to run some tests. I've identified a number of persons who failed the test. And I've told them, all I've done now, I, all I said to the police, these are whom I believe committed the act. Now you go and find the evidence to support my findings. All I'm telling you, look in a particular direction. Instead of looking at 100 people, I've narrowed it down to four. All right? You do your investigative um, skills to identify whether or not. I am saying that these are, and if, if I'm right, then I've made your work a lot easier. But don't arrest them and lock them up on the basis of them failing a polygraph test. Big mistake. So the, in terms of, so that, so, so, so what I do is not illegal. It's just that, the effects are, uh, there are limitations as to how you can use the information. In fact, I tell people that it's the information that I am able to uh, um, glean is even more valuable. I will record, every, in fact, I record every polygraph test that I have administered. In the early days, it was a, it was a, 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 a regular tape recorder. Now it's a webcam. And I introduced the, the camera. So I'm video and audio recording everything with my client's knowledge. Because afterwards, I like to sit and review. And yet it's when you listen to the recording, you say, but wait a minute. The only person who could have known that piece of information is the person who committed the act. Because sometimes if you keep somebody talking long enough, they trip up themselves. They leak information. That is the greatest value of the polygraph the intelligence gathering um, capacity of it. So I tell, that is what I think um, is, is probably, un, a lot of people undersell that. That is where the greater good is. Not, not saying, well, he failed the polygraph. What? In fact, in the early days, I used to say, well, he failed the polygraph test. Now, I, I give my clients, yeah, that, but in addition to them failing the polygraph test, um, this piece of information, does not square with the facts. Or they, uh, they are, we know they're lying because we know that this piece of information is in contravention with known facts. You know, you highlight the inconsistencies in the statement. Because if you, if you keep someone talking long enough, they, they will tell you things which you can later verify as being truthful or, 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 or a lie or untruthful. All right, so yes. Um, all right, now in the States, interestingly, um, they, everybody, one of the reasons why they only probably have 3,000 polygraphers in the United States is because in the 80s, I think it was 1988, they passed an act called yeah. the um, Employment Polygraph Protection Act. And it was the reason for that is because people were, businesses were abusing the use of the polygraph. You had come fast food operated like McDonald's in order to flip a burger there was a requirement for you to pass a polygraph test mm. so what happened is that the unions pushed back and they got they got the um, congress to in, pass this legislation restricting its use all right but in the private sector but interestingly the federal government was 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 in other words they waived that that restriction on the on federal government employees um, for the pharmaceutical companies for courier um, the, the courier companies they are and in the case of pri the private um, sector you you cannot use the polygraph um, for pre-employment all right but you can use it for investigative purposes provided the subject signs a consent form but you can you can't use it to for for pre-employment for screening purposes unless you are working in the federal government and then as i said the pharmaceutical companies and the security companies that move cash okay all right yeah. great thank you hey no problem so uh, is it uh, 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 based on the, uh, this, uh, the, la the last question, is yeah. there any restriction that only some people that can use the polygraph? I mean, that 
uh, maybe in, I don't know in Indonesia, but uh, is it possible that also private can do it, or it's only limited for police? Uh, I don't know in, in in your in your country. It means that uh, you as an expertise can do that, right? But yeah. uh, is, is it in some countries that only some uh, law enforcement law enforcer that can use that? Um, I'm not aware of it mm -hmm. being restricted just to law enforcement community. I'm not aware. Um, I don't think that's the case because I I'm a member of the American Polygraph Association, and mm -hmm. whenever we have our annual seminars um polygraphers from all over the world come and they're both from the private and the public sector so i think it's safe to assume that it's not bad it's not restricted to just um to persons in in um in the public sector okay. in fact we have probably more well in jamaica we actually we now have more persons more um police polygraphers than we have private sector um polygraphers but that was not always the case Okay. Uh, and I think the reason for that is that, um, I mean, the, the, the government has seen the benefits, especially the police force. Our police force has seen the benefits of it. I used to do work for them. Now they don't need my service. So they can do everything internally. And I okay. prefer that anyhow. And the reality is there's so much work out there um, in the private sector. I mean, there are, there are in the States, um, there are people who just do what they call post sex offender testing where if you're if you're if you're convicted of a of a sexual offense like a pedophile pedophile then every yes. six months or every 12 months they they require you to do a polygraph test and that's there are people who just do that okay. well i i don't think i particularly like that i like I, my work um i like the, the fact that no two days are the same i mean today i'm i may be doing some work for a, a hotelier it might be for a um, a port, one of my clients that operate on the one of the um, airport or seaport, um, so a farmer. Um, I mean, I just get to meet a lot of people, and and I and 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 every case is unique. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So uh, about the the instrument, is there any instrument should be like uh, what's called it the uh, uh, re uh, the measure or something like that in a such. Uh, after using like a couple thousand maybe, or uh, it should be like- Well, a, when, I, well when I started out, I used what was referred to as an analog. It was okay. the analog machine. It's the one that used to see on TVs, a big, uh, where you see the pens moving up and down on a-, on a right. In fact, it was on one of the, 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 one of the um, slides, all right? Nowadays, the, in fact, let me get one for you. <clears throat> This is what I'm using. This is this is a this is what the polygraph. This is what this is what the computerized polygraph looks like. Okay. You can see it. Yes. It's a yeah. it's a sensing box, and this is mm. these are the the back of it, and those is where you you attach the various sensors. Okay. All right. So it's 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 a lot more compact now. Um, mm -hmm. I used to prefer the older version because it was a lot more intimidating when people saw the pens moving and the ink, all right? Um, I used to get a lot more, let's say, a lot more um, confessions um, mm. because it's almost like they could hear the, the pen moving a little faster across the paper, oh, all right? Okay. All right, this is a lot cleaner. I mean, there's no ink involved. It's, I mean, they have no idea how well or, or badly they're doing until I tell them, if I'm required to inform them. A um, lot more bells and whistles. As I said, it comes, you can record everything, literally everything, and I record everything because mm -hmm. I want my clients to see that everything was done above board. Because oftentimes when I'm doing my pre-test interview, people complain and say, well, I was interrogating them and I was, and, and would suggest that I was unprofessional. And when I produce the recording, they realize that the, the person was lying on me. In other words, because they can't, if anybody was raising their voice, it wasn't me, it was them, not me. Because I know I'm being recorded, so I'm on my best of behavior. Yeah. yeah. All right. I know. But sometimes, you know, so that's, so it's, it protects both myself and my, and, 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 the, and the examinee. 
with the recording. And I'm, as I said, I make it available to my clients so they have it for themselves. Because during the, when the polygraph is being conducted, the only persons in the room is the polygrapher and the, and the subject. Mm. You, don't you have video also, right? You have video also, right? Yeah, I, that's it. I everything is video. It. Everything mm. is video. I record everything. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from participants? Ada pertanyaan? Yes, one, one more, uh, one more. Uh, yes, yeah. Kari, yeah, about the uh, polygraph. Yes. Is there any involvement new technology such as artificial intelligence usage or Internet of Things to 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 develop the result of uh, the process? Yes, uh, hey, Brian, Brian's excellent question. They've come out, all right, and just before COVID, I went to a, a, a polygraph seminar in the States, and there was a, a company that was introducing what they call iDetect, mm. all right? It's a device, it's a, it, what happens is that they ask, what they're basically doing is they're using the pupil, all right? in order hmm. to determine whether or not the, the subject is lying or speaking the truth. The same, it's the same flight fight um, re response that they're manipulating because one of the, when you, all right, during that flight fight response, in addition to increased blood pressure, increased heartbeat, increased perspiration, um, a change in there in your breathing pattern, there's also the dilation. Yeah, if the pupil of your eye dilates, it gets bigger. That is what that device does. That device is actually measuring the size of your pupil. And the assumption is that when certain questions are asked, if the pupil dilates, then it's assumed that you, you didn't answer that question truthfully. That is still being, I mean, that is early. I mean, it's been, that, that technology has been around for a couple of years, but it's still during its infancy. I think there's, it probably have, I mean, it's something that will develop over time. I know that they're in the States, they're also looking at reading, um, um, what do you call it, brain activity. Mm. They've identified certain parts of the brain where when you lie, those areas seem to trigger, all right? And they're trying to determine which part is where the lies originate from, all right? Again, it's, they're, they're experimenting, all right? But yes, there, there are other things that are being, um, developed in order to make, you know, either to improve the polygraph or to replace it. Mm. One of the, the, why I still prefer the, the, the polygraph over the ID tech, because I've looked at it, is because this is relying on four um, parameters as opposed to one, all right? And, and this is sometimes found wanting, even with the four. So can you imagine, I'm wondering, I don't know what the error rate is with, uh, with the eye detect, but the, what the selling point with the eye detect is that um, you, can, you can determine whether the person is lying in half an hour or 25 minutes. In other words, their, their thing is volume. All right? why, 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 why call in a polygrapher and spend 200 US dollars and have to wait um, two hours to get a result when you can use this eye detect and you can test, say, four people in the space of June, or five people within the same two hours and get the results same time. As to whether it's as accurate, um, I can't. I mean, obviously I'm biased, um, but it, they've been trying to sell it in Jamaica and I know a few companies uh, have, have approached me and I've told them to do their research. Let them, you know, Google, check it out. I know they, they offer it to South America. They're not very big in North America. And I suspect it's because there's been some pushback there. But yes, there are other technologies. And no doubt, um, as I said, um, IA um, is no doubt going to be playing, playing a bigger role in determining whether people are speaking the truth or not. And remember, with the computerized, the, 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 the computerized polygraph will also um, determine, will also give an opinion or a rating as to whether the person is speaking the truth or not. But I, what I have found is still that the human scoring is still more accurate than the, than the algorithm. They still haven't gotten it quite right. I use it as a guide, but I don't, I don't swear by it. 
appreciate captain thanks hey don't mention it okay uh, ada lagi pertanyaan any question from uh, audience okay uh, if no further question i would like to thanks uh, once again to uh, basil for the uh, for today's uh, uh, event webinar so this is our first event in 2022 <laughs> And we are so honored to have you with us today. And then uh, uh, we learn a lot of things. And then maybe uh, one of us will do a, will uh, take a, I think Mr. Andreas will take a polygraph test also. I mean, I mean, uh, <laughs> for, for, for a certified polygraph, polygrapher, right? <laughs> so it's a good thing. All right. so, yeah. Okay. Before we uh, leave, uh, uh, finish this uh, session, I think, uh, can we take a picture? Can we take a picture yes. of uh, yes. Pak Peter, uh, <laughs> Pak Randy, Pak Jerry, uh, Pak Aditya, Pak Teddy, dan Pak Haryanto sudah nyalakan kameranya. Kita akan ambil uh, gambar dulu, foto. Oke, okay. uh, ada lagi Pak Haryanto, Pak Haryanto, uh, Pak Jerry, sama Pak Teddy. Oke, okay. oke, okay. silakan ya. Kita kehilangan dua orang. Oke, okay. kita uh, take a picture. One, two, and three. Oh, hold on, let me take one as well. I want to take one as okay. well. Hold on, please hold. All right, screenshot, where are you? Okay, this is it. All right, guys. Let me make sure I press the right one. Uh, and my yeah. eyesight, not so wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, so take care. Uh, good morning there in Jamaica. Take yes, care. good morning. Bye. -bye. Thank you. All right. Thank you also. Terima kasih semua. Terima kasih. Selamat sore. Terima kasih Pak Ciko, Pak Ade, Terima kasih. dan teman semua. Have a yeah, good time. Selamat. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Selamat sore.